the actual plot and the mythology and all the details that I said don't matter, they actually do matter. <laughs> Hello, testing, test, test. Hi everyone. You are so lucky because you get sleepy carry today and when I'm sleepy I tend to ramble and when I ramble I tend to say things that I usually edit out in my mental dialogue so who knows what I'm gonna say today I will be interested editing Carrie good luck to you we are going to be talking about the books that I read in September and before I do that I want to pass us over to uh, Carrie who has a message for us. Carrie number two, where are you at? Hi, it's me from another time. I'm so incredibly excited to talk about the books for Book of the Month um, who sponsored this video. Thank you as always. Book of the Month is a service where they have a team of readers comb through all of the new releases, pick all of their favorites in a variety of genres and you as a subscriber will be able to choose your book or more um, for one controlled price. They're all going to be, like I said, new releases. They're all going to be hardcover. Um, and the books this month, I gotta tell you, are insane. You can use my code Carrie. Everything will be linked down below to get your first book for $9.99. And they just announced they are now shipping to Canada. So they are expanding. Keep supporting Book of the Month. Um, hopefully we will get them fully international one day. But yeah, if you are in Canada and you have been interested in Book of the Month, um, try them out. It is especially this month. I mean, the books that I chose, I got Thistlefoot and this is um, based on kind of Jewish folk tales. Also, you get this really pretty box every time. I forgot which books I picked because this month Foul Lady Fortune by Chloe Gong is also a choice. So I forgot if I had picked that or something else and I was talking to one of my author friends and she was like, have you read this book? It's like nothing like I've ever read before. And I did pick it. So good job, Past Carrie. Um, I got as long as the lemon trees grow. I have heard nothing but absolutely fantastic thing. It's a story that takes place in Syria. It's about a pharmacy student who is just trying to live her life. She ends up um, volunteering at hospitals. She's torn with wanting to leave and be safe, um, but also staying and, you know, loving her country and protecting her country and everything. It is apparently a love letter to Syria and its people. It is a stunning speculative debut that burns with the fires of hope, romance, and possibility. So excited to read this as well. So yeah, you can check out the list of books for October. I will link everything down below. Again, you can use my code Carrie. Um, but yeah, I got these two, but like I said, Foul Lady Fortune is a choice. They're, they've just got some great picks as always. So that is book of the month, information in the description box. Thank you as always. I will send you back to the past. See you then. <laughs> so for the first couple of books in my September reads, you can watch my four most anticipated reads of 2022. They like all came out at the same time in which I read The Ballad of Never After, Babel, Venom, A Venom Dark and Sweet, and The Final Gambit. Um, so really quickly going through them. Um, the Ballad of Never After is one of my most anticipated reads of the year. I have talked about Caraval before. Um, it's a trilogy by Stephanie Garber. It's about this mystical island where there's this magician guy who throws this kind of game competition and it's just a good time and I felt it very strongly with the trilogy but Stephanie Garber's writing just gets better with every single book and so her new series which is starting with Once Upon a Broken Heart um, it takes one of the characters that was in the Caraval trilogy and continues his story. When I tell you the writing, she just like learned how to make people yearn. Like I remember, this is so random, but I remember an interview with, I think it was Tom DeLonge from Blink-182 and he basically said like they were a band for so long that they just knew when they sat down to write a song, they like knew how to get emotions from the listener um, and so they could write a song very easily and achieve that emotion they're trying to get, right? Stephanie knows, like she knows. Questions I get a lot. Do you have to read the Carval trilogy in order to jump into Once Upon a Broken Heart? Ugh. Technically, no, I wouldn't recommend it. Here's the thing, if you 
are never going to read Carval, you want it to be completely ruined, then yeah, you can, because it does talk about like one kind of key point um, in the trilogy and obviously like how it ends, like who ends up alive and all that stuff. Um, so technically you could, but one of the main characters is something called a fate and that is uh, something that is touched upon heavily and like built out and explained really well in the last two books of the trilogy. You might be a little bit confused. Basically there is something called the Deck of Destiny and it's kind of, you can think of it as tarot card. There are like eight people, eight places, and eight objects or something. Doesn't super matter. As far as the people go, as far as the fates, they're kind of like evil gods. Some of them are mad and some, you know, um, and we follow the Prince of Hearts. And Once Upon a Broken Heart starts with our main girl Evangeline having her heart broken and she goes to the Prince of Hearts as if he is a god and asks him to help her out. And things just go wild from there. So Ballad of Never After follows, obviously, everything that happens in Once Upon a Broken Heart. We learn about so many layers of curses. It's one of those books that like you have to read the series again. Like the details that are hidden in this plot you learn one thing like there's a little plot twist or like a little like piece of dialogue and then it's just like a huge light bulb moment and you have to almost go back and start again and realize the symbolism that you missed i mean it was it's a book that the more that i think about it the more that i talk to people about it like so many of you guys in the comments um in that video mentioned things and i was like oh my god I didn't care about this one tiny scene in which this happened, but like, you're so right. Oh my God, it's a big thing. I really enjoyed it. I mean, cat's out of the bag. So she did announce that it is going to be a trilogy or well, there's going to be a third book. We don't know how many books are going to be in this series, but this was initially sold to me as a duology. So I'm reading that book thinking it's gonna, this is it, everything has to wrap up. And it ends in this way that she could have ended it there and she would have been evil. Like she would have been my arch nemesis for the rest of my life. In the middle of the action, it just doesn't feel like anything's happening. It's just a lot of yearning and stuff like that. But once you realize certain symbolisms, you realize that actually every scene, even if they didn't seem like it was pushing the action forward, it was telling us something. And it's just like, <sighs> Ballad of Never After, highly recommend, highly recommend. <laughs> and then I read Babel, which I also really enjoyed. I also thought that the middle was a little bit too long. This is a kind of alternate history, fantasy. It takes place at Oxford University in the 1800s. We follow our main character who is named Robin and he was born and raised in Canton in China. When all of his family dies of, I believe it was cholera, he gets whisked off to London by this mysterious professor kind of guy and he begins learning a bunch of languages and we don't quite know why but we know it's very important that he maintains his fluency in Mandarin and Cantonese but also that he learns Latin and Greek and it's all about translation work and then he eventually goes to Oxford and joins Babel which is the translation kind of institute and stuff like that and he's with four other students we follow them kind of on this journey and I don't have much to say about it other than I did really enjoy it I think that it was very sharp didn't let anybody off the hook I think, I, I tend to think that fantasy, especially when fantasy tends to talk about monarchy and, you know, colonization and stuff like that, authors tend to pull back a little bit and like not, to not make certain readers feel bad, you know? Or like, you know, the monarch is okay because he's actually like a really sensitive guy and he just cares about his people, you know? Something like that. Um, but Babel like did not pull any punches and it was just very matter of fact, really important to read, I think. Gave me everything that I wanted it to give and more. It's also based on um, the author R.F. Kuang's time at Oxford. So it's a very personal project. Just great. So if you're intimidated by the length or anything like that, definitely only read it if you're interested in linguistics and history. Um, but yeah, just excellent. 
Babel. Um, and then, unfortunately, in September, um, my Grammy passed away and I had to go back to the States. I was lucky enough to go back um, and be with my family for a couple days. So I ended up having back-to-back, -back, literally back-to-back, 15-hour -back flights. And I just wasn't able to really focus on anything. Um, so I, on the flight back, <laughs> I read Shatter Me one, two, and maybe three. I don't remember. Um, I was honest, honest to God, I was skimming them hard. Okay. Um, I've already read Shatter Me, but I get a lot of questions of people asking me to read it. So I feel like I just got to give you my thoughts again in case you're one of those people. Um, I have read Shatter Me before, and it is a series about a girl. It, we're in like this dystopian, almost post apocalyptic time, and we follow our main girl who has a specific power that makes her a danger to society, and so her family sends her off to live basically like in an asylum, but it's definitely just like a prison cell and eventually in our story she gets wrapped up in this resistance movement but on the other side people are trying to use her as a pawn in like the regime all this stuff so it's one of those series that first of all you can it's okay if you only read one two and three personally there's like eight or something there's also a ton of novellas like in different povs i've only read one two and three and i can safely say you can stop there. It's one of those books that I would have eaten up in middle school. Oh my god, like in the Hunger Games, just like that general dystopian era that we went through. It had that kind of edgy writing that happened in the like early to mid 2000s where in the beginning it's told um through our main girl's POV and she's kind of gone a little wonky because she's been in solitary confinement for like almost a year or something wild so her the actual way that she speaks changes throughout the book as she kind of comes back to being who she is so the beginning is really like she's super number based because that's all she can do in her prison cell is like count things and so um i thought that like that i again would have eaten it up when i was younger um but now i just kind of see Mm. It's just one of those things where you like go back to a book that you would have loved in childhood or that you did love in childhood and you kind of notice some things that like don't sit well with you as like an adult <laughs> who's been in like a healthy relationship. So, mm. but yeah, I did, I did skim Shatter Me and it helped kill a couple hours and I think she's still writing the series. If you want to dive into it, those are my thoughts. It's just more of like a could pass. I, again, it would have been loved. It would have been absolutely adored if I read it 10 years ago so then I read A Venom Dark and Sweet which again I talked about in my anticipated reads this was the sequel and finale to the A Magic Steeped in Poison duology I loved A Magic Steeped in Poison it had every single element I love oh my god it's a fantasy the magic is linked to tea tea ceremony brewing tea it's about a girl whose mother and sister are tea masters i suppose so you can either like make tea as a potion so like it can help you be brave or something or as we discover the magic can actually do so much more than kind of what they're taught but our main girl's mother dies from a poison like from tea which is weird because tea is like sacred um and she finds out that her sister is actually starting to show signs of the poisoning as well and so when there is this nation kingdom wide call for this competition of tea masters to come to the royal palace and do a competition to become the next royal tea master our main girl is like i'm gonna go i'm gonna win this thing even though she's technically not like an official tea master so she's not supposed to go she just steals her sister's identity she's like i'm gonna go i'm gonna win and then i'm gonna have an audience with the emperor and i can ask him to use his vast resources to come and help my sister because they live in like this tiny town and of course stuff gets messed up <laughs> as it does i loved a magic steeped in poison enemies to lovers 
a tea-based magic system competition, you know, like just mm, checking all the boxes. A Venom Dark and Sweet didn't do it for me, unfortunately. The way that the story wrapped up, it ended up taking away all of the elements that I loved from a magic steeped in poison. The competition was gone. The romance, they were split up the entire time, so we didn't see them until kind of like the end, interacting whatsoever. Even the magic, like, it kind of changed. I do think, like, she ended it well. She ended it as it should have, like, as the story was told, it was just for me and my preferences. The things that I loved were gone, and that's a bummer. So that is A Venom Dark and Sweet. After that, my last of my most anticipated reads um, was The Final Gambit. This is the finale to the Inheritance Games trilogy, the Inheritance Games, Hawthorne Legacy, and The Final Gambit. This series is a mixture of Knives Out and I don't want to say like Clue, but like some people say The Westing Game, which I don't think I've ever read. This girl out of nowhere um, is told that she has inherited all of this billionaire's money that she like literally the wealthiest man in the world inherited all of his money has never heard of him before his family is obviously shocked and appalled and confused the only stipulation in the will is that she has to live in the manor for one year and then bada bing bada boom she has all the money she's like 18 okay no she's 17. the trick is i mean obviously the family is pissed so she has people who like may or may not want to kill her living in the house with her but also this rich man had four grandsons and he has trained these grandsons since birth to treat everything as a puzzle and so they really see our main girl as just another piece of the puzzle and the house is filled with secret passageways and everybody has a weird past and blah 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 i loved inheritance games hawthorne legacy didn't enjoy it because it was i think this was supposed to be a duology and it was stretched into a trilogy and you could really feel it in that middle book just stretching it out and then the final gambit i think that in terms of the actual like mystery it went back to the feelings that i got with inheritance games so i did enjoy that part but then there were other bits that were explored in the hawthorne legacy such as romance etc that i felt i was really let down by i think the ending was a little bit like a little corny but overall like i thought that she kind of got that magic back from the inheritance games i just wish that she had not made a couple choices that she made but overall it was still a really solid series if you're into that kind of kooky house mystery hidden passageways riddles and stuff like that there's a couple characters that are just like hilarious so yeah i would still highly recommend the series just like you gotta trudge through that second one but that was the final gambit next up i read violet made of thorns and i thought that this was a standalone but it's actually part of a series from what i remember i don't remember anything but i wrote down part of a series but felt like it could be a standalone so my heart isn't wrecked dot 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 oh 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 yeah i remember the ending okay yeah you get mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ooh, is this what it feels like to like remember the plot all the time so a violet made of thorns is an enemies to lovers it is uh kind of marketed as being similar to the cruel prince and i do agree the love interests are i would say similar to cardin and jude how like they're kind of not great people what this book is about is obviously a fantasy and it takes place in a kingdom where there are what are they called not seers there are basically people who can see the future and they're very rare um and so every kingdom kind of has one like a royal one um and so our main girl is that one uh, for this particular kingdom and she is following um, the previous we'll just call them seers the previous seer right before she died gets up and like gets all misty-eyed and delivers some bad news basically the prince is going to fall in love or something and this will be like either the demise or the the saving grace of the kingdom because there's some kind of curse 
on the kingdom it's you learn more about it as you read i can't give you too much but basically everybody's main priority is trying to get the prince to get married and fall in freaking love so that they can save the kingdom from whatever is happening our main girl is the one who's like really pushing this because her future seeing powers aren't that strong actually and so she was asked to look into the future at this like big royal event and she made a pretty big claim and she was like yeah the prince is going off on this tour of the world um and when he comes back he will have met his bride and so our story starts when he comes back and he didn't find a bride and she's like come on man like don't make me look bad so she is really pushing him to very quickly find somebody so that she also doesn't look bad, right? I didn't love it simply because I warmed to neither of the main characters. Like I said, they kind of like aren't super lovable people, but you can see why they like each hate like each other, you know? Um, so I would say it's not bad. Like if it definitely, I even without them saying anything in the marketing, I would have mentioned a Cruel Prince vibe, just maybe not as developed. The world isn't quite as rich, certainly. I think that Holly Black just did something with the Cruel Prince that like cannot be copied. But if you're looking for another enemies to lovers, thought it was all right. I thought that everybody was like low key a villain or like not a villain, but like just not a hero character, you know? So um, that is A Violet Made of Thorns. The ending, now that I remember it, I will definitely continue it, but I would need to do a reread because, whoa, I, I'm holding on to that plot by a thread. But yeah, that was A Violet Made of Thorns. Okay, so on Instagram, I follow this really great creator called The Borrowed List. Her name is Erin. I will link her down below. But she randomly mentioned this book that she was reading and thank god later she was like oops didn't realize this was part of a series and i read the second one first so i didn't make the same mistake and i read it in the correct order so thanks erin for making that <laughs> mistake it is the queer principles of kit webb and the perfect crimes of marion hayes these are both romances set in england in the 1700s i'm gonna say this from the get-go if you enjoy plots that make sense and are convincing these might not be the books for you the romance was sweet especially in the first book so the queer principles of kit webb follows uh mainly two characters we have kit webb who is a retired highwayman which means that he would with his like group of bandits they would like be on the roads and stop carriages and rob them blind basically he's quit that life because number one he got really badly injured and when he got injured his friend and like main partner was killed and so he was kind of like i'm out i'm opening this coffee shop and it's got a little it's got a little library too it's very cute we have percy who is the son of a duke and he has found that his life is about to be totally screwed up and he needs help of a robber he needs something stolen from someone who's very difficult to steal from and somehow he gets the name of kit and he starts going to the coffee shop to convince kit to work with him and he is like everything that kit hates right he's a, like relatively royal he's always just like prim and proper um and kit just hates everything this guy is about the banter i was laughing out loud i absolutely enjoyed them just like that's all i want i just loved percy and kit and i wanted so much more the actual plot the actual like robert the like heist and everything that takes place um don't read it for that just don't read it for that <laughs> because you will be disappointed if you want like a satisfying ending but i i just so sincerely enjoyed the queer principles of kit webb and this author is known for their queer representation in their books i just thought it was really refreshing but just so hilarious and fun which made me immediately dive into the next book which is the perfect crimes of marion hayes and this book follows directly after kit webb and it is the same it's just like the other two characters 
within the first book. So definitely read Kate Webb first, but The Perfect Crimes of Marion Hayes follows Percy's childhood friend slash stepmother <laughs> now. She married his father, the Duke, in order to, you know, it's what women had to do. We know Marion Hayes and then there is another character um, and this again I think that even more than Kate Webb, Marion Hayes the plot is um, don't read it for the plot like straight it's there is no plot it makes no sense but the romance so good and so different like I said this author is really committed to queer representation and they talk about things that I have never read in a romance before um, and it was just, again, really wonderful. I don't think the banter was quite as good as the first book because Kit and Percy's personalities are just, well, mainly Percy's personality is just like the best thing I've ever read on paper. Um, but these two, Marion is very much the like grumpy one and our other character is the sunshine one that everywhere he goes, he like collects kittens and you know he just like can't stop talking to people he's super jolly he is the golden retriever boyfriend right so their banter is not as just like wild because marion doesn't like to talk to be honest but i just felt like the actual romance and talking about intimacy and stuff like that was done really really well it did not feel like it was in the 1700s like this it don't read it if you want historical accuracy don't read it if you want a heist plot i had a good time i enjoyed it that is the queer principles of kit webb and the perfect crimes of marion hayes and now the book that i can't wait to talk about oh my god so i listened to your advice and i finally read gideon the ninth <sighs> guys I didn't know anything about this book whatsoever and then I read the blurb on the front that is like lesbian necromancers wander around a haunted mansion in space and I was like you don't say jumped into it immediately I am so glad that I did you guys this is the funniest book I have read in such a long time I was howling the plot like there is a plot and it it makes sense but i also there were many times where i was lost and it didn't really matter because the main thing is that gideon is the funniest character ever this is about this universe galaxy i don't know we're in space okay and there are nine planets on the ninth planet there is a tomb that was sealed so the ninth planet their job is to guard the door and then there's the eighth planet which does something and seventh planet does something like everybody has a role everybody has a power i'm sure that like hard ass gideon the ninth fans are listening to this like carrie you're fucking this up but for me in the first book the plot like it doesn't really matter i feel like that blurb gives you what you need every member of the kind of like royal family of each planet is summoned to one of the planets to become this thing called a liker L lictor basically this like immortal very important being in the universe the only people who can go is the one royal that was invited and their cavalier which is basically like their bodyguard the person who is the warrior for them you know if there's a duel kind of thing and so when we meet gideon our main character they are attempting to escape the planet for the millionth time in their life because they hate it there but of course their escape gets foiled and the princess princess reverend daughter is like listen i'll help you get off planet but the only way you're getting off is if you come with me and they oh my god they hate each other and it's a wonderful oh my gosh their relationship is so good and she can't really say no so off they go to what they find is this basically haunted house in space and they meet all of the other royals and their cavaliers and everything like that and that's pretty much all i can tell you about the plot without spoilers so that's as far as i'm going sorry gideon's personality is one that i feel like most authors would give the side character like you know when you're reading a book and you end up loving the like best friend character because they're just chaotic good basically they're so funny and so just off the rails and they don't really make sense that's gideon 
and so I feel like most authors don't put that kind of personality to the main character because it makes the plot insane but but this author did and it's so funny I can't even tell you the amount of lines that I underlined I was howling like literally laughing out loud in public because of this book the dialogue is just out of this world so funny I absolutely ate this up and then I started Harrow I bought Harrow the ninth okay this is how invested in this series I am and I am so confused I know it has to be this way Harrow the ninth is the sequel um and I can't really tell you anything about it lest I spoil it but we basically follow Harrow who is the reverend daughter princess so Harrow and Gideon were like team nine you know so we mainly follow Harrow in this and I understand why the book completely changed but again kind of like a magic steeped in poison this it's missing that element that I loved about Gideon the Ninth. I've read about 25% of it and I'm putting it down. I am going to finish it, but I put it down simply because like, A, I bought it, so I'm not in a time crunch. Most of my books come from the library, so I know that I can come back and read this anytime. Um, but also I just feel like I need to be, it's a book that requires a little bit more focus. The actual plot and the mythology and all the details that I said don't matter. They actually do matter <laughs> and so um, you need to be paying attention a little bit more especially in Harrow the Ninth where it is just everybody warned me that my brain was gonna be a little bit messed up after I read it and I'm I was feeling the like tugs even 25% of the way through so I'm putting that down but I would just even if you don't continue the series it's worth it just to read Gideon the Ninth like it's just <laughs> it's so funny like I it brought me so much joy and I just really hope that you read it. Idiot in the Night, thank you to everybody who mentioned it. Brilliant. After that, I reread Soulmates um, by my friend Susan. It just came out this month and we did a little live on Instagram. Um, if you want to watch that, Susan saved it on her Instagram, so I'll link it down below. But this is a young adult childhood friends to lovers um it is about two friends um who grew up together in san diego until one day jacob goes back to korea and just kind of abandons hannah his other friend and for like four years or so um they have not had any contact and hannah especially feels a type of way about this she is really upset um, and so when one summer he comes back, let's just say they've got some stuff to talk about. Um, it's really wonderful. Susan um, took a lot of inspiration from her life in it um, in terms of growing up, struggling with her Korean identity, and then suddenly living in a world where one day everyone is obsessed with Korean culture. Um, and so Hannah is really struggling with that as well. Um, and it takes place in my hometown of San Diego, so I'm like extra... Um, in love with it but yeah this is soulmates out now her debut novel very proud of her yay um so that was a quick reread for me um and then i read our wives beneath the sea because cindy mentioned it and i think cindy liked it like if if cindy likes a book i'm gonna put it's gonna be on my radar and i'm gonna put a hold on it so i finally read our Wives Beneath the Sea. For some reason, I thought that this book was going to be like mythology related or something. I don't know. Like I, I just had a totally different idea of what it's about. Um, and it's actually about this couple, Miri and Leah, I think. And Leah, of course, the one that I need to talk about the most. I don't remember her name. We'll call her Leah in this video. Um, she is some kind of researcher um, that studies the ocean. And we learn about this very, very slowly, but she basically comes back from a job changed. And her wife, Miri, is like trying to deal with this change she apparently was gone for quite a long time like again it's one of those things that we learn about what happened really slowly and that's really the whole point of the book so i don't want to tell you too much but there's points where it's quite surreal but it's also just about grief and what does it mean to lose someone and how do you let go of things there's just so much in it um that was so beautiful my only qualm with it is that 
there are so many questions I have because really the whole point of the book is the relationship and loss and love and stuff like that but in the background there's all this weird kind of like sci-fi dystopian stuff happening and I just want answers and we never get them and I'm just like I I, I know it's not the point but like can you tell me what's going on in the background like mm. so um I just highly recommend it it was really beautiful heartbreaking surreal not what I expected it's modern day a really great book like could be one of my favorites of the year took me totally by surprise our wives beneath the sea <laughs> after that I'm trying to I'm trying to find a way to like not sound mean about this book but this was just a book that I did not like and I ended up laughing at it the book is dead romantics okay it is a romance it is about our main girl who is a ghost writer for this romance author and she lives in New York City and originally she's from South Carolina where her family for generations have had a funeral home and what else can I really tell you there is a romance that involves a dead guy <laughs> because uh, is this a spoiler no it's not it's no it's not a spoiler I think it says so in the back of the book she can see ghosts whatever as a premise I knew it was gonna be a little bit odd and especially reading it the same month after like losing a family member and going through the whole funeral process and stuff like that maybe it was just a little too close to home and i felt like it was a little i know everybody grieves differently but like there is a loss of someone very important in her life and it just it just didn't it felt weird it just felt really weird there was also romance happening at the same time i put this on my like close friends on instagram because at the, i'm still sure that people might think that this sounds bitchy and it might be but there's a character that's supposed to be like the best friend who is like the badass girl boss right and there is a line in there where it's introducing this character who i forget their name but let's call them carol okay and it's like carol is so great at what she does that's why after two years at her advertising agency she's already a social media manager <laughs> as a social media manager that was my job for like six years it's a it's a great job but like if you're trying to say the whole point of that sentence was to make her seem like this amazing girl boss right to get to that level in some companies that's a starting position so it felt like the author just didn't know anything that she was talking about. The main character is supposed to be like a grandma stuck in a 30 year old's body, but then she also like goes out partying reluctantly, but like still goes out partying with her girl boss social media manager friend in like these high Louboutin heels, which she's a ghostwriter. Her friend is a social media manager. How are they living in Manhattan buying Louboutin heels? what like it just the characters there was nothing lovable about them it felt like i was reading like last month i read funny you should ask and i was just flabbergasted reading it like where is it where is the thing that i'm supposed to like about this book and that's how i felt about the dead romantics i would just say like if you were thinking like ooh, a ghost love story maybe this is good for halloween that's those are my thoughts those are my thoughts <laughs> after that though since i'm not gonna i'm not gonna leave you with an angry book um my last two i read spells for forgetting by adrian young adrian young is one of my favorite young adult authors she wrote fable and namesake and the last legacy and i just oh, oh and sky in the deep she has like a norse duology norse mythology duology and then she has like this low-key like pirate vibe thing going on love love her work so spells for forgetting is her first adult novel and i set aside the day for her i knew that this was going to be autumn perfect autumn vibes so i lit a candle sat on my couch 
the whole day and read this book. I go more into detail, I think, um, in my autumn books video that I posted last week that you can check out. This book was a little bit of a letdown simply because I love how unique her worlds are and this particular story is one that I've read before. That being said, I think it was well done. So on one hand, I wanted something super new, but she didn't let me down in terms of like the story was good, okay? It is about this island called Sersha off the coast of Seattle. We have our main guy named August who we learn was kind of like kicked out of the island, like the townspeople sort of ran him and his mom out of town when he was 18 and he hasn't been back since and it's been 14 years, but his mom passed away and her one wish was to be buried on the island with the rest of her family and this is an island where there's like five or six families that have lived there for hundreds of years and the only time that there are other people on the island is during apple picking season because that's when the tourists come in from the ferry and they come and they pick their apples and there's like legends of magic on the island so they also come and like get their tea leaves red and stuff like that and then they just go home and so for the rest of the year the island people are like only it's like the super small secluded community right he has to go back there um not only to bury his mother's ashes but also they left like without warning and so they still have like a car and a house and all this stuff just abandoned there for 14 years so he has to go sell the house and like cut every last tie to this island and be gone it's told in multiple povs um, as we find out why he was kicked out of the island and maybe there was a murder and maybe not everything is as it seemed. It was just like creepy, the end of autumn turning into winter, Pacific Northwest like pine trees and fog and magic and woods and stuff like absolutely 100% got the vibes down and I thought the story was good like the fact that it was this kind of low-key fantasy thriller it did what I wanted it to do it just wasn't like I was kind of expecting another fable fable was a duology that like I'm not gonna get again and I know it um so I would still definitely read it if that uh, summary kind of enticed you. It was paced well. I thought that the jumping of the POVs was a little wonky because it's more than one and sometimes we only get a POV of this like one particular person just once. Um, I like it when it's like if you choose two people and you just go back and forth, okay? But when you do like person A, B, A, B, A, B, C, B, D, A, F, it gets a little yeah. It wasn't a perfect book, but if you're looking, like I said in my previous video, for a good kind of autumn feeling, spells for forgetting, and it's a standalone, so. And oh my god, last but not least, the book that I read today, <laughs> and I literally just finished hours ago, is Curse of the Wolf King. I was looking up books that were on Kindle Unlimited, basically, because I don't have any books in from the library right now, and so I found these. It was recommended to me. I've heard of this author before. She just has a bunch of these. They're basically fairy tale retellings, and this one was based off of Beauty and the Beast, so I knew I probably wasn't gonna like it, so like, my fault for reading it. it wasn't good, but it ended up not being bad. The first 100 pages, I didn't like it all. Um, it is about a girl who ran into some trouble in the past and so her family moved to a new town but this new town is in the fey realm but you like rarely see the fey so it's fine they live in like a human city whatever she is dead set on like doesn't want to get married she's done with love whatever happened was like romance related and she's just like not about that life so she is going to find a job get her financial independence from her father and live her life. And so she finally finds a job offer for a house steward, which is basically like the house accountant and like running the household. Um, and she's done that before, she's good at it, she enjoys it. She goes to this job interview and everything goes kablunk from there. There is a cursed fairy king. It's Beauty and the Beast. What am I going to tell you? It's Beauty and the Beast. There's enough added stuff to it that you're not just straight up rereading the fairy tale. Like I said, the first 100 pages did not enjoy because it was really pounded into us that 
our main girl is not like the other girls and then when we meet the beast oh my god what a pain in the ass he is i would not be able like there's obviously character growth but like how could you fall in love with someone who does his job so badly his actions are explained but like when you meet him he just is so like incompetent and so dumb and obviously mm, things change for a hundred pages they're bickering they're so annoying to each other literally this is a line so he's showing her around the house and he's like there's the west wing but don't go there why what's in the west wing what's in the west wing he repeats in a mocking tone what do you think is in the west wing <laughs> like he's so immature and he's so <gasps> it ended up being like quite funny i wouldn't read it if you like want a serious pulling on your heartstrings romance kind of thing if you're willing to like not take the book seriously and kind of just laugh at it it passed the time and it's on kindle unlimited i don't know if i'll continue it but i'll definitely like keep that series in the back of my mind for whenever i just like need a hit of that you know <laughs> so just to really quickly um wrap this up i'm also still reading my year of meats by ruth ozeki this was given to me by my friend she left me a note i love it kind of like with harrow the ninth when i have a book that's not from the library and i don't have a time limit I tend to really take my time um, and this is a book that I can really take my time with this is about ooh, it's told in multiple points of view but it basically revolves around this television show that this Japanese company is making for Japanese housewives to promote eating meat particularly beef they want Japanese housewives to buy more beef so the TV show is taking American wives and having them like show their life and then at the end of the episode cook their favorite beef product so we follow like one of the Japanese housewives we follow one of the wives that was on the show we follow the producer of the show I'm I'm really loving it Ruth's writing is incredible so I'm just like stopping and underlining things a lot I'm really taking my time with it because it's just so enjoyable to read um and so yeah I definitely recommend my year of meats if you're okay with like reading about meat I'm a vegetarian but like I don't know if people are like turned off by that but yeah there is though I will tell you there is talks about infertility and eating disorders um and I'm only a quarter of the way through so just in case and yeah so that's what I've been reading I've just had a lot of fun like even if some of the books I didn't enjoy I didn't enjoy them but they like made me laugh and they brought some feelings into my life once again thank you to book of the month for sponsoring this you can use my code carrie um to get your first book for 9.99 and once again they have just started shipping to canada so if you have been waiting for that um if you are in canada you can now uh get book of the month so all that information will be down below thank you as always book of the month love you so much and um i will catch you guys next time i will be in the states I should be in the states as you're watching this right now so hey yeah let me know what you're reading my holds my holds list is long the actual books that are available to me is short um so yeah let me know what you're reading and uh love you always okay bye mm -hmm.